Throughout this almost 20 year ride, World of Warcraft has had unbelievable highs and unforgettable lows. From Wrath of the Lich King to a full year in Siege of Ogrimmar. From Warlords of Draenor and another full year in Hellfire Citadel to the wonderful Legion. As somebody who's always championed Legion, I believe it's World of Warcraft's best ever work. Today I'm asking the question, is it as good as I remember? Let's find out. This video will be broken up into segments, which I will chapter and timestamp in the description if there are sections you would prefer to jump to. The first part of this video will be a story recap, which will be the longest segment by far, so feel free to skip over that if you have no interest in it. I'll also be skipping PvP, as I wouldn't be able to give a clear evaluation on it. I hope you'll enjoy. Before we jump into Legion, we have to document the ending of Warlords of Draenor, and regardless of what a car crash it was, it did pave the way for Legion narratively. Blizzard pulling the plug on Warlords early and redirecting most of their resources into Legion was very clear to see the amount of care, love and quality that went into it. Warlords of Draenor was really disheartening because the potential was there to create something really great, and ultimately it was just such a waste. It's without a doubt the biggest what if in World of Warcraft history. Some backstory that you may not be familiar with. After Illidan's defeat to Arthas in Northrend back in Warcraft 3, Illidan would return to the Black Temple to recover, begin to train both Blood and Night Elves to become Demon Hunters, also known as the Illidari. They would go on to attack many Legion worlds, Nathraza being the one of most importance, which is the home of the demonic Nathrazine, the Dreadlords, who served the Legion. He'd also sort of project his spirit onto Argus to spy on kill Jaden, but he was found out. However, Illidan was saved by a really powerful Naru who also gave him a vision of himself in the future, now wielding light magic and being a champion of the light. This vision disturbed Illidan immensely. Illidan and his army's mission was to obtain a Sargerai Keystone which would allow travel to every world controlled by the Legion. This campaign took place at the same time that the heroes of Azeroth raided the Black Temple in the Burning Crusade. Whilst Illidari was successful at obtaining the Keystone after slaying Brood Queen Tirana, who was the leader of the forces in Mardum, they would return to find their leader dead at the hands of our heroes, Maiev Shadowsong and Akama. Maiev would have all of the Illidari arrested and put into stasis inside Green Crystals, along with the corpse of Illidan with the Keystone now in possession of the Wardens. With Archimonde's defeat in the finale of Warlords of Draenor in Hellfire's Citadel, we see Gul'dan pushed into the Black Gate and into the Twisting Nether and ultimately our timeline, tasked to open the way for the Burning Legion to return once more. Gul'dan would make his way to the Tomb of Sargeras, where he originally met his end in Warcraft 3, as he was torn to shreds by a swarm of demons. Alternate timeline Gul'dan would open an ancient sealed portal from the War of the Ancients, securing the Legion's invasion. The leaders of the Alliance and Horde were told and would assault the Broken Shore, the island where the Tomb of Sargeras is. The Alliance and Horde forces, led by King Varian Rin and Warchief Vol'jin respectively, were separated and pincered, which led Sylvanas to wave off the archers that had been assisting the Alliance, leading Varian and Greymane to believe the Horde had betrayed them. The assault on the Broken Shore proved futile, with Varian sacrificing himself to save his forces, allowing Gul'dan to disenchant him on the spot. Vol'jin was also fatally wounded, and with his dying moments declared Sylvanas his successor as Warchief. After the assault on the Broken Shore, Gul'dan and Cordano Felsong, who was the traitorous warden from Warlords of Draenor, would attack the Vault of the Warden searching for Illidan's body, which was intended to be used as a vessel for Sargeras. Maya freed the Illidari, as she despised the Legion more than the Demon Hunters. Gul'dan was successful at retrieving Illidan's body, as well as the Sargerad Keystone, and would escape the Vault. The Illidari also escaped and would pledge themselves to both the Alliance and the Horde. The invasions would continue across Azeroth, with Jaina moving Dalaran above Karazhan in Deadwind Pass to defend Stormwind and nearby areas. Khadgar expressed Dalaran should be used in defence of all of Azeroth and for the Horde to be let back into the city. A vote was called and passed, with Jaina left furious as she left and wasn't seen again until Battle for Azeroth. Khadgar would task the champions of Azeroth to search both Karazhan and Alduar in a bid to stop the Legion invasions. The existence of the artifacts known as the Pillars of Creation would be discovered. These were given to the Titans during the Ordering of Azeroth, but were later used in the War of the Ancients to close the portal in the Tomb of Sargeras, the same portal that Gul'dan has now reopened. The Pillars of Creation were scattered across the Broken Isles, which would serve as the new continent in Legion, with the Kirin Tor teleporting Dalaran above the Broken Isles. The Legion were already making progress with corrupting the denizens of the Broken Isles, with many allying with the Legion, including the people of Surimar, the leader of Surimar, Grand Magistrix Elisand, was worried what the Legion would do if they didn't bend the knee. 
the player characters would be tasked with finding the Pillars of Creation and returning them to Dalaran. The heroes of Azeroth would secure 4 out of the 5 Pillars of Creation. In Stormheim, the player character would face off with the Felscorn, a Rykel tribe loyal to the Legion. They would compete with them for the Aegis of Agrimar which was held by Odin, a Titan Keeper who resided in the Halls of Valor. Odin was trapped within the Halls of Valor by Helia, the first of the Valkyr, out of spite for the transformation. Odin once managed to get a look into the Shadowlands and see how the Kyrian were carrying souls of mortals into the afterlife. Inspired by this, he made the Valkyr. The first Valkyr Helia wasn't happy with this, so she cursed him and trapped him in the Halls of Valor. The champions of Azeroth managed to defeat the Felscorn and obtain the Aegis of Agrimar. They'd also visit High Mountain where they would meet an uncorrupted black dragon named Ebonhorn, while also obtaining the Hammer of Kazgaroth. In a cursed Night Elf region of Azuna, they would obtain the Tidestone of Golgoneth after having some trouble with Queen Ajara's Naga. And lastly, in the region of Valsharar, the heroes of Azeroth would face the Emerald Nightmare, a corrupted version of the Emerald Dream by the Old Gods and the Void. This corruption was spread by Xavius, former advisor to Queen Ajara. The battle against this corruption was tough, with the dragon aspect Yazira falling into corruption and ultimately having to be killed. After Yazira's defeat, the champions of Azeroth would claim the Tears of the Loon, the fourth pillar of creation. Then our heroes would go into the Emerald Nightmare and cleanse the Dream of Corruption, defeating Xavius. In Val Shirar, we would also find and free the imprisoned Mai of Shadowsong with the help of her brother Jared. The fifth pillar of creation, the Eye of Amanthul, was kept in the city of Surimar, which as mentioned earlier is allied with the Legion. It would take the heroes of Azeroth months before they would be able to free the city with the help of the Nightfallen, a faction of exiled Nightborn who refused to ally themselves with the Legion. They were cut from their power source, the Nightwell, thus withering and dying. We would seek their help and would slowly liberate Surimar city and the surrounding region. The Alliance and the Horde would occasionally clash, most notably in Stormheim, where the forces of Sylvanas and the Thanos would fight with Alliance forces led by Gen Greymane. As we now know, we would find Sylvanas making shady deals with Helia, who was also allied with the Jailer. Helia then gave Sylvanas an item called the Soul Cage, that Sylvanas was supposed to use to enslave Aeir, the leader of the Valkyr, and then force her to give the Valkyr to Helia, who would corrupt them, making them servants of the Jailer. Raymane thought Sylvanas wanted to use Aeir to continue raising Forsaken, so he chased her down and found her torturing her, and then managed to break the soul cage and free her, proclaiming that he took her future the same way she took his sons when she killed Liam during the Cataclysm. After we deal with the problems in Val Shirar, something would fall into the orbit of Azeroth and onto the shores of Surimar. Khadgar instructs us to recover this artifact, which would turn out to be the core of a Naru called Zira, which contained a message from the Army of the Light in Turalyon, who went missing with Illyria after the destruction of Draenor. The message says to seek out Prophet Velen. We head for the Exodar, which is under attack by the Legion, led by Velen's corrupted son. Velen explains to us that only Oros, the last descendant of Zira, can unlock the core. However, Oros is destroyed by the Legion. We defeat Velen's son and leave for Dalaran. Before leaving, we overhear that the Drenai are preparing to work on a vessel that will take them back home, to Argus. The Light's Heart, the name for the core of Zira, remains in Dalaran until Khadgar figures out that the Tears of Elune could be used to activate it. The plan succeeds, and we get a vision of Zira who tells us she seeks the Child of Light and Shadow, Illidan Stormrage. It's strongly hinted that Zira is the same Naru who gave the vision to Illidan while rescuing him from Argus. She explains that the Light's Heart can be used as a vessel. She would then send us to the Illidari who searched for the soul of Illidan and found out it was being held by Helia in Helheim setting up the raid for the Trial of Valor. We would defeat Helia, obtaining the soul of Illidan, which would be kept in Light's heart until we were able to recover his body. The defeat of Helia also liberated Odin from being imprisoned within the Halls of Valor. While working on liberating Surimar, the champions of Azeroth would have to go back to the mainland and stop the Legion from taking over Karazhan. We're successful, and we also get to meet the spirit of Medivh, where he and Khadgar have a touching moment. The forces of Azeroth, now together with the Nightfall, and slowly encroach upon the city of Surimar. All that remains is the Nighthold, where Grand Magistrix Elisand and her loyal followers reside. Not only that, but Gul'dan is atop of the Nighthold, the Nightspire, where he is performing a ritual to use Illidan's body as a vessel for Sargeras. Furthermore, the Eye of Amanthul, the last pillar of creation, is right there too. The crusade into the Nighthold begins as we conquer everything, including Elisand, and make our way to the top of the Nightspire where we fight Gul'dan. 
During the fight, Gul'dan uses the powers of the Eye of Amanthul, and near the end of the fight, Sargeras would take possession of Illidan's body for a brief while, but is ultimately defeated by us. Khadgar then uses the Light's Heart to transfer the soul of Illidan back into his body, resurrecting him. He proceeds to disenchant Gul'dan until all that is left is his skull. Then we get an interesting moment where Illidan decides to crush the skull to pieces, rather than consume it as he did in the past with main timeline Gul'dan's skull. Now that we have Illidan back and all five pillars of creation, it was time to strike back at the Broken Shore. Kil'jaeden would increase the intensity of the invasion, while the class orders would unite into a coalition called the Armies of Legionfall, and this time, were successful at assaulting the Broken Shore and establishing a foothold. We make our way towards the Tomb of Sargeras, where we plan to seal the Legion portal with the Pillars of Creation. During the fight at the Broken Shore, an alliance play would find a compass that belonged to Varian Rin. They would show this compass to King Anduin, who would come to the Broken Shore to witness the place where his father fell. Here he would recover his father's sword, Chalamet, which would light up once again. Also during this time, Death Knights, known as Death Lord of the Ebon Blade, supplied with the information by Lich King Bolvar, going to the Ruby Sanctum, the main residence of the Red Dragonflight, to seek out information regarding a great dragon skeleton in Northrend. The Death Lord is then given a choice to murder all remaining dragons here, or spare them. The armies of Legion fall, led by Illidan, Velen, Maiev, and Khadgar, break into the Tomb of Sargeras, placing the Pillars of Creation at various points to seal the entry of demons into Azeroth. We then fight the Fallen Avatar, locked in a Titan facility beneath the tomb, reawakened by Kil'jaeden. After the Avatar is defeated, we would chase after Kil'jaeden into the Twisting Nether. We'd end up on his spaceship making its way into the orbit of Argus. We would finally defeat Kil'jaeden, and with his dying words, said that he was always envious of Velen, and never really believed that Sargeras could be stopped. Velen places his hand upon Kil'jaeden's forehead in silence, out of empathy or perhaps forgiveness, and Kil'jaeden dies. The spaceship, sustaining heavy damage and with no one to steer it, would start crashing into Argus's orbit. Illidan uses the Sargeras keystone to bring us home, but in doing so, also opened a massive rift between Argus and Azeroth, essentially allowing easy travel with the two now in each other's orbit. Khadgar is horrified by this, but Illidan smiles and says that the hand of fate sometimes must be forced. It was mentioned earlier that the Drenai would start work on a vessel that would bring them home to Argus, and that work is finally done, and the vessel known as the Vindicar is ready to go. Our heroes would make their way to Argus, and here, we would witness the arrival and the crash of the Xenadar, a major spaceship of the Army of the Light, an army that was comprised of the survivors of Legion invaded worlds. Here we finally meet Illyria and Turalyon, the fabled legends of Azeroth who disappeared decades ago. They ended up in the Army of the Light, where they fought the Legion for a thousand years, with time working differently in the Twisting Nether. We're also accompanied by Lothraxion, a light-infused dreadlord who was sent by Turalyon to aid the Paladins during the Broken Isles campaign. Along the way, we'd meet Eridar survivors who refused to bend the knee to the Legion, but was still mutated into the Broken called Krokul. We would make our way to the Crash Zenadar, where we would recover the Shards of Zira. Returning the Light's heart, Zira's core would reawaken her. She would see Illidan, and bent on fulfilling the prophecy of the Child of Light and Shadow, the vision Illidan saw of himself as a champion of the Light, she began imbuing him with the Light. Illidan was very much against this. He believed there were no Chosen Ones, and he already had experience with trading freedom for power before, so Illidan would get enraged and would destroy Zira, blowing the Elder Naru to pieces. Turalyon, incandescent with rage, would take a swing at Illidan, who would quite literally just grab his sword. The Argus campaign would now begin, with our heroes and their allies making their way towards Antorus, the Burning Throne, which served as the final raid of Legion. It was here where they hoped to strike at the very engine that resurrected the souls of the Legion. They would also come across the seat of the Triumvirate, where they would fight a darkened Naru whose powers Illyria would consume, granting her powers of the Void and a new Voidfall. She was known to dabble in the powers of the Void before, for which she was even imprisoned by Zero before the crash landing on Argus. Magni Bronzebeard, Speaker of Azeroth, came to Argus, and upon arriving found out that Argus also had a world soul. We would invade Antorus, freeing the Titans Sargeras kept after capturing their souls. We would also visit Elinaria, where we would protect Aenar. Along the way, we would also fight Varimathras, who was gravely tortured for his actions from Warcraft 3 to Wrath of the Lich King with the Forsaken. Now that all Titans were freed, we would get teleported to the seat of the Pantheon, from which the Titans wanted to use the power of the World Soul of Argus to imprison Sargeras once and for all. The World Soul of Argus is brought to the seat of the Pantheon 
severing his connection with the Burning Legion. We could see a growing cloud looming over Azeroth. Sargeras was coming. The main reason Sargeras could never claim Azeroth was that he didn't know exactly where it was in the cosmos. With the rift opened by the Salgarad Keystone after the raid of the Tomb of Sargeras, Azeroth was now closer than ever. Sargeras would command the soul of Argus to rise and kill Azeroth's champions, as well as the Titans, imbuing Argus with some of his powers, who were ultimately successful in defeating him. At the end of the fight, Sargeras would finally emerge, desperate to strike at Azeroth, and would manage to stab the planet with his sword, Gorobol. The Titans would use their collective powers, along with the last of Argus's energies, and would imprison Sargeras within the seat of the Pantheon. Illidan would remain here to serve as Sargeras' jailer, while the champions of Azeroth would then make their way home with the Vindicar, accompanied by the Army of the Light. The rift between Argus and Azeroth would close, and a red star would adorn the skies of Azeroth. Sargeras' sword would leave a giant wound in Silithus, and cause the planet immense damage. Magni would then use the powerful artifacts the champions of Azeroth gathered, such as Ashbringer, Doomhammer, Blades of the Fallen Prince, and even Zalatath, to stop Azeroth from dying, but weakening the artifacts permanently. As a nice epilogue to the story of Legion, we find a crystal on the Vindicar left behind by Illidan. Through it, we hear a recording of Illidan telling us that the crystal contains two messages. The first one was from Malfurion, Illidan's twin brother, telling him how the teachings of Scenarius were never for him, and how he wished to quell the strife that divided them, and telling him to take care of Tyrande. The second message was for Tyrande, the love of Illidan's life, who chose his brother over him. Illidan tells her that he always kept her in his heart as his anchor, and tells her to take care of Malfurion, and that she made the right choice by choosing him, even though he sometimes wished it differently. After delivering the messages, Illidan tells us to go to the second well of eternity atop Mount Hyjal, a monument to his dedication to Azeroth, and leave the crystal there, where it is revealed that there is one last message for you, the player character. A projection of Illidan, Malfurion, and Tyrande sitting on a bench appears. Illidan tells us that we've proven our commitment to Azeroth, and that our dedication and sacrifice rivals his own. He then tells us that the defense of Azeroth is now in our hands, and with that, the message is over, and the echoes would dissipate and fall into the Well of Eternity. This is without doubt the biggest storytelling experience World of Warcraft has ever done, and this felt like a true conclusion to the events of Warcraft 3, excluding the storyline of Arthas which obviously ended in Wrath, or eventually Shadowlands if you have the courage to say that. I'd just like to say that I'm not an expert on the lore by any means, and full credit of this story recap and the segments regarding the Order Hall class campaigns were taken from a post on Reddit, which you can read in the description if you're interested. Class Order Halls felt like garrisons done right, or a bit better at least. I mean, at least you actually saw other people this time, right? On a serious note, this felt like something players have been crying out for for a very long time. Player agency and class fantasy or identity is something that felt lost for a really long time until Legion, and now sadly does again post-Legion in my opinion. It was a hub for your class, enriched with lore, and was a great foundation for different types of content. Artifacts, class quests, class mounts, and so much story to discover. Similarly to garrisons, you would acquire followers that you could level up and send off on missions to bring back certain things. Artifact power, gold, items for your followers, battle pet currency, and so much more. Each class order hall had its own campaign, mostly side quests, so here is a list of some of the important things that affect the story of Legion and beyond. The priests would meet Kalia Menethil, the last living heir of Lordaeron and sister of Arthas, and they would also turn a Void God back into a Naru, showing us how the Light and the Void are two sides of the same coin. The priests specialising in Shadow would obtain Zalatath, an ancient sentient blade of unknown origin but that was used in service of the Black Empire. This blade would play a major role in Battle for Azeroth, and will be at the forefront of the War Within. The Paladins would find Tyrion Fordring trapped on the Broken Shore, where he was presumed dead. However, he would die here, and a Paladin would take up the mantle of Ashbringer. As a Paladin main, this made me sad, and his death seems so forgettable if you aren't a Paladin player, and this just felt like a cop-out so the player could just wield the Ashbringer. For such a storied character, and the man who actually shattered Frostmourne to be done dirty like this? I don't know. It was... it was sad. You deserved better, Tyrion. The Death Knights would raise new four horsemen. Nazgrim, Thoris Trollbane, Darian Mograine, and Sally Whitemane. Originally, the Death Knights would attempt to resurrect Tyrion Fordring as the fourth horseman, as the Death Knights would storm Light's Hope Chapel in an attempt to steal his corpse. The Death Knights would fight Lady Leodrin and attempt to begin a ritual only to be burned by searing light. 
Darian Mograin would open a death gate to save the player and the horseman, but would pay the price for it and die. What is dead may never die. Showing great courage and leadership, Darian would be raised and become the leader of the horsemen. Players would also reconnect with the Lich King Bolvar Fordragon, while also reforging the Shards of Frostmourne into the Blades of the Fallen Prince. The Shaman would gather the Earthen Ring and make peace among the elements still in chaos after the Cataclysm. A Shaman would also become the wielder of Doomhammer, after Thrall found it unusable because of the guilt he felt after Garrosh Hellscream's death. The Rogues would be joined by Vanessa Van Cleef, an important character in the stories of Vanilla and Cataclysm. A couple of classes would also find out what's below Tirithal Glades, the Tomb of Tyr, a Titan Keeper who was instrumental in creating the Dragon Aspects. The most important part narratively is the Illidari storyline, who would make contact with the soul of Illidan Stormrage, which was out and about in the Twisting Nether after being expelled from his body by Gul'dan to make space for Sargeras. Illidan is more demon at this point, so his soul is more demonic than not, thus roaming the Twisting Nether. Illidan would instruct the Illidari to seek the Sargerite Keystone and also go to the Black Temple to seek the help of Akama once again. Akama wasn't really into this, so the Illidari would separate the soul of Akama, taking the piece that was loyal to the Illidari with them, as he knew all the plans for destroying the Legion. The Illidari would also break into the Vault of the Warden, slaying Cordana Felsong to retrieve the Sargeride Keystone once again. I've always been a one character Andy, having always stuck to my Paladin, but the Class Order Hall gave me a reason to want to play different characters, because there was new content and story lock behind each class. It was motivating and exciting, and it begs the question as to why Blizzard moved away from something that was so widely praised. We could put it down to laziness, or perhaps what felt like a hangover with garrisons, or maybe this was just an attempt to reinvent the wheel with expansion features, such as Covenants in Shadowlands. Covenants had massive potential, but when you tie power to them, it defeats the purpose, because players 9 times out of 10 are going to choose the one that is the most powerful. It felt like class order halls were perfect, but they didn't envisage it going beyond Legion, and for them, it served its purpose. Depending on how you feel about weapons, your opinion may vary. I know some people who absolutely loved the artifact weapons, and some who felt really sad knowing they would have no weapons to look forward to in the dungeons and raids of Legion. I think the weapons were a brilliant idea, but weapons have always been a huge draw in content too. Of course we could talk about really fun trinkets and tier piece bonuses, but weapons just hit different. Literally. It also felt a bit odd to be sat in the class order hall with everybody wielding the Ashbringer, but I thought it was genuinely a very cool idea. I do understand the disappointment or frustration some players would have by not having any shiny new weapons to look forward to though. I think Blizzard tried to combat this with relics you could put inside the artifact weapon. They strangely reminded me of Materia from Final Fantasy VII a little bit. Relics would enhance specific traits in your artifact weapon, as well as boosting the overall item level of the weapon. I'll praise Legion to the moon, but I'm very mindful that Legion paved a cruel road for World of Warcraft to war with the introduction of borrowed power and an insane increase of tasks required of you. It didn't feel so bad in Legion, at least for me. It was grindy, but I liked that, and MMOs are essentially time sinks anyway. Admittedly, it didn't feel nice to dump all of your artifact power in one weapon, effectively locking yourself into that spec. Borrowed power was a novelty at the time, and for me, it was an incentive to play the game more, do the tasks, and get stronger. The amount of bonuses and quality of life that existed in the artifact trees was a huge draw for me to keep pushing myself, by grinding more of souls until I couldn't see anymore, I mean, completing world quests, obviously. It felt akin to levelling in classic World of Warcraft and earning talent points. Putting those points in your artifact weapon tree felt exciting and rewarding. This ultimately got out of hand with both BFA and Shadowlands, and thank god we're back in a place now with a good old fashioned dedicated talent tree. However. It does have me curious how many times they will expand this current talent tree before tearing that down for something completely new. Dailies were also revolutionised with the introduction of World Quests. World Quests would reward gear, reputation, gold, currency, and most importantly, artifact power, which would be used to gain levels with your artifact. I know, I know. It can't all be perfect, right? Legion had its flaws for sure. If locking yourself into one spec with artifacts wasn't enough, can I interest you in a Zephyr's secret, perhaps? The legendary system in Legion was unforgiving, and it took no prisoners. It's a sad thought to receive a legendary item and be disappointed with it. Legion had what was called a legendary eligible activity. For example, kill a dungeon or raid boss, 
open a treasure, open an emissary cache, etc. These would increase your chances of receiving a legendary drop. Once a legendary drops, the chance of your next legendary resets to the base drop chance, and then you'll work your way up again. However, you had no control over the legendary you would actually receive, with some being a whole lot better than others. This could essentially make or break some specs, with some guilds or pugs even going to levels of not taking people to certain content if they didn't have their best legendaries, something that was totally out of the player's hands. In patch 7.3.5, an additional method to obtain Legion legendaries was implemented. The purified Titan Essence item can be purchased for a thousand Wakening Essences, and will grant a random legendary, which didn't exactly help you target the one you were looking for, if you still didn't have it by then, but it would at least help eliminate other legendaries. At the end of the day, everybody who plays WoW or games generally know there's going to be a meta and a route to go, whether that is talent builds in WoW, Diablo builds, Heroes of the Storm talent builds, there will always be the route that will give you the best possible performance. And whilst variety is the spice of life, most people just want to perform the best they can. Case in point, Covenants in Shadowlands. Hold tight hero talents in the War Within. And whilst I can appreciate them being creative and having fun with some of these legendaries, tying them to RNG was a great failing of Blizzard, and arguably the biggest blunder of the expansion. So what's your item level now? What do you mean? Well, now that you've got a legendary. Oh, I can't equip it. Shit. As mentioned in the story recap, Legion saw the return of the hero class with the introduction of the Demon Hunter. The Demon Hunter had been considered twice before, in both the Burning Crusade and Wrath of the Lich King respectively, but Blizzard didn't feel ready to introduce a new class in TBC, and in Wrath, it just didn't make much sense with the theme of the expansion. I remember people being upset they were also yet another leather wearer coming off the back of Monkey Mr. Pandaria, which didn't seem great, but Demon Hunters looked immense. Seeing abilities in the developer preview like Metamorphosis and Eye Beam looked so good. Demon Hunter was the first class to only have two specialisations, Havoc for DPS and Vengeance for Tank. They originally started at level 98 and had their own introduction starting quest zone on Mardoom, which would serve as the flashback to when you and the Illidari are sent on the mission by Illidan to receive the Sargerad Keystone that I mentioned in the story section of this video. The mobility of the Demon Hunter was a huge talking point, with both Felrush and Ventral Retreat making it super easy for them to get around. They also possess a double jump and a built-in glide function. I feel that Havoc had a very strong place in Legion as a powerhouse DPS, but outside of the mobility it just felt pretty boring, and there wasn't a great deal of complexity to the class and Vengeance, on the other hand, just felt like it really struggled to find its feet as a tank in Legion. I think Legion had the best dungeons of any expansion, and for me, it's not even close. Halls of Valor, Eye of Ajara, Blackrook Hold, Moor of Souls, Vault of the Wardens, need I go on? These were stone cold bangers. The fact that Legion would expand on dungeons as the expansion went on too, with the likes of Cathedral of Eternal Night and the Seat of the Triumvirate, is something we haven't seen since, we were truly spoiled in Legion. The introduction of Mythic Plus transformed World of Warcraft forever, and as a pillar of what modern World of Warcraft is today. Mythic Plus was heavily inspired by the challenge modes we had seen in both Mists of Pandaria and Warlords of Draenor. It's a system that offers players an endlessly scaling challenge in 5 player dungeons. The system allows players to compete against a timer, and has much more lenient times so the emphasis is on solid execution, rather than pure speed. Depending on the time you finish a key, it can level up to a maximum of three times. Dungeons have various affixes that will change on a weekly basis to create challenges, keep things interesting, and have you think of alternate ways you may approach a dungeon that week. To begin a Mythic Plus dungeon, at least one player in the party must have a Mythic Keystone, which can be obtained from the last boss of a Mythic dungeon or your weekly challenges chest, the Great Vault as of Shadowlands. Mythic Plus wasn't without its issues early doors, if you fail to finish a dungeon in time, your keystone will be depleted. Depleted keystones can still be used to start dungeons, but those dungeons won't reward loot at the end. If you do beat the timer on a depleted keystone, your keystone will be restored, so you can attempt the next difficulty for loot. This was really frustrating if somebody would rage quit the group, or if you had party members randomly disconnect, as opposed to the iteration it has now, where it would simply go down the level if failed. The weekly challenges chest mentioned before was also quite odd too as you were essentially rolling the dice on any potential loot from a random dungeon, as opposed to the ability to pick and choose the reward in the Great Vault like in Shadowlands and Dragonflight. 
Mythic Plus is great in the sense that you can just simply plug in and play. You don't have to be online at a set time or have a raiding schedule to stick to. Just find four people to play with and away you go. Along with the introduction of Mythic Plus, we were also introduced to the Mega Dungeon series. This has been a staple since its inception in Legion, as we have now seen Return to Karazhan, Operation Mechagon, Tazabesh the Veiled Market, and most recently Dawn of the Infinite in Dragonflight. Mega Dungeons are massive five-player dungeons that use a lockout system similar to raids. The dungeons also eventually get split up into two separate dungeons when they're added to the Mythic Plus season. Legion was already knocking it out of the park for me, but that Karazhan trailer was amazing. Karazhan is in my top five raids of all time. I actually booked a week off work so I could play the hell out of Return to Karazhan, but then got incredibly ill so I couldn't play at all. That was sad. Anyway, the reintroduction of Karazhan was a masterstroke by Blizzard. I never had any complaints about it, it would be having to farm Drape of Shame, which is obviously a fault of Titan Forging, which we'll get to, but I can't tell you the amount of runs I put my friends through for that. Return to Karazhan was such a beautiful hit of nostalgia, and to re-explore it and see how things had changed was so much fun. I'm really glad they continue to expand on the Mega Dungeon series, and I can't wait to see where they take it next, as I feel they've all been excellent. I thoroughly enjoyed raiding throughout Legion, and I have fond memories of every raid. Besides maybe Tomb of Sargeras, that place was just, um, pain. The Emerald Nightmare fights were okay. It felt interesting finally getting this close to the Emerald Dream, after it had been a wish of the players for so long. Visually, it felt a bit dull or samey, and it's honestly quite a forgettable raid in my opinion. It would probably rank last place for me. I really enjoyed healing Ursoc, and I know some people didn't like it, but I really liked the Scenarius fight. But I felt Xavius was a bit of a letdown as a final encounter. Trial of Valor was just a filler raid, but I did enjoy it a lot more than the Emerald Nightmare. I really enjoyed Odin, although it was a bit of a long encounter, Warm was a lot of fun, and I thought Helia was really cool with the intermission phase. I sadly never got to do this on Mythic, but thoroughly enjoyed it on Heroic all the same. The Nighthold is the gold standard for Legion raids, and is also in my top 5 raids of all time. Every boss was unique and engaging, and I don't think I had any issues with any of the bosses in there, although Mythic Star Augur is by far one of the most mentally taxing fights I've ever done. Gul'dan was brilliant, and the detailed story in the build-up made this raid feel epic. If I had to pick a favourite fight, I think I'm honestly going to have to go with Croesus, with Tychondrius just missing out on top spot. I think Croesus is such a simple but well-designed encounter. I think the Nighthold is probably where some of my happiest memories of WoW are, period. Tomb of Sargeras. Yikes. Welcome to hell. Tomb of Sargeras is just nightmare fuel. Can I call it a guild breaker? Is that a thing for Tomb of Sargeras? I feel like it was. I was looking forward to this raid so much, as it has so much lore and history to it, but this raid genuinely made me miserable. The constant soaking was just such a drag, the raid felt very punishing, and it became so tiresome that my guild actually folded. I can't even remember how far we got. I think Sisters of the Moon Mythic, and my guild just had enough and didn't want to play anymore. The raid felt exhausting. After my guild folded, I continued to play and did Antorus Mythic, which I thought was brilliant. There were some great fights in here. Healing Imanar was a ride, and I loved Coven, Agrimar, Kingaroth, and Varimathras. Take your pick, really. This raid had a lot to offer. This place had stunning visuals, the stakes were high, and it was an epic ending for Legion. Thunderforging was introduced in Mr. Pandaria for the Throne of Thunder raid, and Warforging would follow in Siege of Ogrimmar. Thunderforged loot was designed to be a rare chance drop from normal and heroic bosses, which would award an additional 6 item levels to an item. For example, normal mode loot in Throne of Thunder would have had an item level of 522. Thunderforged normal would raise this item level to 528. The same would apply for heroic, with regular heroic items at item level 535 raising to 541. You could also use seals for a chance to potentially roll an item from a boss's loot table, which also had the chance to Thunderforge. As mentioned, this trend continued into Siege of Ogrimmar, renamed Warforged, and then in Legion it would be Warforged and Titanforged. And this is where it started to get out of hand, and the carrot on a stick method for loot was truly realised. Receiving Warforged gear in Legion became a lot easier to achieve, as you could get it from world quests as well as dungeons and raids. Receiving Warforged loot in Legion would increase the item level of loot by 10 item levels. If it gained 15 item levels or more, it would be considered Titanforged, with the gear potentially going 45 item levels or higher. 
I remember doing an LFR in the Nighthold once with somebody getting a Convergence of Fates trinket from Elisan, but it Titan forged, so it was almost the equivalent of the Mythic version, which just felt ridiculous to players who were actually progressing those fights. This felt extremely frustrating if you were targeting your best in slot gear, as you would never ever feel that your character's set was truly complete, as there was always a chance for your gear to war or titan forge. The same would apply to gem sockets being on the gear if you were lucky enough, or tertiary stats, such as leech and avoidance. Whilst the latter still exist, I think we can all agree, good riddance to this terrible modifier. Is there anybody out there who doesn't still quote, An, an illusion? illusion? What, what are, are you hiding? hiding? I refuse to believe it's just me. This is another prime example of something that has been left to rust by Blizzard, the city of Suramar. It's too good to be left to waste. I would love to see it transformed into a Horde capital at this point. Music in WoW has always delivered, and the music in Suramar is no exception. It felt like so much love and care went into this place. It reminded me of when I first saw Gilneas back in Cataclysm. It just looked so far ahead of anything else they'd ever done. Suramar felt like an actual city. You have NPCs walking around and doing different jobs, guarding, cleaning, cooking and so on. The buildings were all unique. I actually read on Reddit and had to check for myself to see if it was true. There are wine cellars where time is sped up, so you walk at 300% speed, and you can watch the workers restock shelves at lightning speed. I know some found Suramar tedious, and there will always be complaints regarding things, whether it be the ancient mana grinding, or things getting rep gated, or whatever it may be. But for the most part, it was very well received, and the storytelling in this zone was brilliant. It's one of Warcraft's best ever zones in my opinion. The only complaint I would have with Suramar is having to navigate it with a ground mount. Which leads me to my next subject. It would feel disingenuous to leave Pathfinder out, because I know it was an issue for some players in Legion. We'd only seen Pathfinder once before in Warlords of Draenor. It served as a two-part gatekeeping achievement in Legion, which would allow you to fly in the Broken Isles once completed. The achievement was account wide, and part 1 tasked you to explore the 5 Legion questing zones, complete all major storylines in the Broken Isles, complete 100 different world quests, complete your Class Order Hall campaign, and to earn revered reputation with the 6 Broken Isle factions. Completing part 1 of this achievement would grant your ground mounts increased movement speed. Part 2 was implemented in patch 7.2. Part 2 required you to explore the Broken Shore and hit Revered with the armies of Legion Fall. Originally, you also had to complete a Legion invasion in each zone, but this has been hot fixed out. Pathfinder upset a lot of people as they saw it to be pointless and frustrating. Even more so when people were gatekept from flying in these continents after those expansions were no longer relevant, like Draenor or Kul Tiras and Zandalar for instance. Legion, without a shadow of a doubt, had the best patch cadence any expansion has seen. Besides Dragonflight, which has done really well in releasing content at a similar pace. 77 days is what people would say. 11 weeks and it would be time to sink your teeth into something new. There was also a pattern with Legion's releases. The patches contained new dungeons, new story quests, and introduced new zones and artifact weapon revamps, with Concordance of the Legion Fall and the Netherlight Crucible respectively. It wasn't so much the pace that felt so good about Legion, but every patch in Legion felt like there was always a reason to play and participate. When in comparison to something like Warlord's 6.1 patch which introduced the selfie cam, this felt amazing. Legion is one of the rare expansions I've played without ever unsubbing. I feel like Blizzard have done well to try and replicate this with Dragonflight, albeit players still complaining there still isn't enough to do in the game, and the structure and vision is obviously a bit more different now too, with World of Warcraft being seen as a seasonal game. Let's finish with a nice one, the Mage Tower. A true fan favourite of Legion. It challenged players to conquer unique solo class specific encounters and was a true test of mastery. I love that the rewards were simply artifact skins and not gear like it's so often the case with WoW. I'm an extremely average rep paladin but I made it my mission to get the Ashbringer skin because I was so in love with it and I still use it today. The Mage Tower was so successful and pined for that it made a return permanently in Shadowlands, with the reward being a Legion themed transmog. You could also work towards an achievement called a Tour of Towers, which would reward you with a soaring spell tone mount. Huge props to anybody who has that mount. So to answer the question, I think, yes, I do think Legion is as good as I remember it to be. It isn't perfect by any means, but nothing is. Like any other expansion, it certainly had its issues. Legion's biggest strengths were its storytelling, the amount of love and care that went into all of the classes, and the replayability that it offered. 
as I previously mentioned, it paved the cruel road for WoW to walk for some time, with borrowed power and the amount of chores and tasks that were expected of you. This video is my opinion, and you may have similar or completely different views to me, and that's great. These videos are made for discussion, entertainment, and opinion. So enough from me. I want to know what you think. Is Legion all it's cracked up to be? Would you play Classic Legion if it ever got to that point? Do you think Legion is overrated? Or perhaps like me, do you think it was peak World of Warcraft? Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. Thank you so much for watching, especially if you sat through the entire thing. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking and subscribing, and I'll see you in the next one.